Consider this, 100% of owners will leave their business one day, but few are prepared. Are you? Don't worry, you're in the right place with this podcast, Succession Stories. Host Lori Barkman, the business transition Sherpa, guides you from transition to transaction, from building value in your business to letting go. Lori is a business transition and M&A advisor, specializing in growth, acquisitions, and selling owner-led companies. She's also the author of the Business Transition Handbook. Get your copy and learn how to avoid succession pitfalls and create valuable exit options. Sign up for a business transition newsletter at successionstories.com. Show us the love by subscribing to the show and posting a review. We appreciate you. Now, here's this week's Succession Stories with Lori Barkman. For any business, regardless of size, innovation is an essential part of growth. We live in the age of entrepreneurs who are disrupting large companies more than the large companies are disrupting each other. Technologies like generative AI are enabling us to create value at a rapid pace. How do we explore new ideas that can drive radical value for your customer? Mike Stemple is the Amazon best-selling author of two books, Million Dollar Ideator, The Surprisingly Simple Way to Quickly Create Profitable Ideas, and Innovating Innovation, Why Corporate Innovation Struggles in the Age of the Entrepreneur. His ideas have created millions in revenue and helped millions of people. Mike's journey of creativity, curiosity, and innovation began with a life-altering event, an accident that ended one chapter of his life, but opened another. He's a successful entrepreneur who has built more than 20 companies and products, including Skin It and 3M Original Wraps, those vinyl stickers you can put on tech devices like your ear pods and phones. Mike shared a unique story about Skin It that will definitely inspire you. It's a moving story that illustrates his belief that innovation is about solving problems for customers. This is truly one of my favorite conversations. Enjoy this Succession Stories episode that just might inspire your next million dollar idea with Mike Stemple. Is this the year to sell your company? Don't leave your exit to chance. Stony Hill Advisors works with entrepreneurs like you to get ready for what may be the biggest transaction of your life. Learn what your business is worth by visiting stonyhilladvisors.com slash podcast. Mike Stemple, welcome to Succession Stories. This is going to be a very fun interview because it's more so a discussion than an interview. And I love that you're coming to the table with a ton of experience and working with mature, large enterprises on innovation. So welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to do this podcast. We're going to talk about many things related to innovation, but I think the best place to start is your background. You have some superpowers mm -hmm. when it comes to creativity and I thought you could share with me a little bit more about that. I think there was a accident that triggered mm -hmm. some creativity in your life. And I wanted you to just share that with me. Sure. I'll start at high school. So I graduated high school and decided to join the Army. I wanted to serve my country, uh, very patriotic growing up and was a combat medic. Did very well in the Army, so well that they kicked me out after two years and were paying for everything for me to go get my medical degree. And so I came back to the civilian world and doing my undergraduate with an idea that I was going to be a doctor and going pre-med. In my senior year of college, in the fall, I was in a car that someone ran a stop sign and my head got thrown against the, the door frame of a, a truck and uh, damaged my brain. So I got a traumatic brain injury, not in the military, which is ironic. And I got in the civilian life. And in that instant, I lost both my mil military and my medical career. Got pulled out of school, couldn't function. One of the side effects that happened is I damaged the, the front temporal, right temporal area of my brain, is uh, I started becoming hyper-creative. It's like I almost forgot all my education, all those times the teachers told me to stand in line, sit in my seat, pay attention, stop imagining, stop daydreaming. It's like all that disappeared, all that training disappeared. And I returned back to the state that I was when I was five became hyper-creative. Every single piece of paper around me that I saw uh, that was blank, I saw artwork on it. So I started drawing like crazy. 
And uh, six months after that car accident, I had a new career. I was a very well-known sports artist. I painted these huge murals in Denver, Colorado, on the side of the highways for featuring like John Elway, Dikembe Mutombo, the Nuggets, and Andres Galarraga, the Rockies. And very, very quickly, within six months, I became one of the most visual recognized artists in uh, my hometown of Colorado. That's an amazing, amazing story. I'm so I'm so glad you shared that. Traumatic brain injuries are very, very serious, and mm. that you came away with a new skill, a new passion is just an, an amazing story. And I could probably do a whole discussion with you on the artwork, <laughs> and maybe in, at the end of the show you could share how people could uh, can find some of your artwork. So we'll we'll put a pin in that for now. Let's talk about this creativity. Do you think that there's something inherent uh, in in how your brain thinks to invent? You've invented a lot of different technologies. How did you enter that process? Share a little bit about problem solving. What problems were you mm -hmm. solving? And, and share just a little bit about the technologies themselves. I think there's a wide sure. variety of the types of tech that you've invented over the years. Yeah. One, I think every single human being on this planet has the power to be creative. You spend time with five-year-olds and you will see creative geniuses running around like crazy. It, I, I think it's innate within us. I think it's it's built into our DNA. Uh, and then through our educational process, that gets distilled down until we're really, really good operators, really good factory workers, really good obedient adults. And uh, so I come from the, the belief system that we're all creative, that we all have within us the ability to create. And for me, it took a car accident, but I've also worked with tons of people, hundreds of people, where I didn't take a car accident. What it took is an, an identification of the mindset of a five-year-old, how do they see the world? How do they think of the world? Well, how do they consume the world? And what is that? What about that experience when we're younger that we can tap into as an adult? One of the big ones is just question asking, just being curious. A lot of us stopped being curious. So for me, after my car accident, and I did art for a number of years, I got bored with it. It was kind of exhausting working with all these pro athletes, to tell you the truth. And so I, I switched very quickly in the late 90s. Uh, I learned to code, and I started building websites. And I started asking a lot of questions around the reality. So technology to me is always a toolkit. So whenever I see new technologies, like right now, the, 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 the technology that's in vogue is generative AI, but I see all these not as definitive things, they're just tools, so like paintbrushes um, to me. I am learning about the capabilities of technology is the easiest jumpstart to come up with ideas. Because when you understand, for example, how Bluetooth technology works or Wi-Fi technology works or all the sensors, the dozens of sensors that are, exist on the cell phone, when you understand their capabilities and you have that knowledge now, you've asked a thousand questions and kind of figured it out, it naturally creates a whole new set of questions is how can I use this to change the world around me? And so that leads into the philosophy side of ideation, which is I see the world as incomplete. So my definition of innovation is the human response to evolution. So I think evolution is constantly happening. Things are evolving. And I don't mean uh, evolution in the Darwinian sense. I mean, evolution is the root of things change. Everything's constantly changing. And how we respond to that as humans is innovation. So when you have this understanding of core technologies and you start to see them as tools to build the next, the next next, as I call it, the philosophy piece comes in where a lot of people accept the world as it is. And I see the world as incomplete. So it's frustrating. It's, it's a gift and a curse because everything I see around me is a version V1, V2, but there's a V3, four or five that I can see as shadows behind it. And I believe it is my responsibility as a human to create those new versions. We all have this capability, by the way, that the next next is our responsibility. It is our desire. It is innate within us to create it. And so that's the philosophy side of it. So those two things come together, the knowledge and the tool set and the curiosity and the question asking combined with my belief system that we actually build the future combined together. And that's how I've been able to do so much. That's so well articulated. I love that you talked about a philosophical view so many technologists that I've met along the way, I've worked in startups and I've worked in big companies that have tech teams. A lot of times they're just looking to solve a particular 
problem, a very small problem. They're not looking at the bigger picture problem. The other thing that resonated with me when you were sharing, it reminds me of my friend, Sean Amirati. Sean was on this show, episode 19, many, many moons ago. He and I worked together at Carnegie Mellon University. He's the executive director of the Corporate Startup Lab, which is all about mm -hmm. corporate innovation. And Sean loves to say that entrepreneurs are seeing the world as it is today and thinking about what they can do to, as you said, to make it better, to do that next. And they think about the way it ought to be. You two are kindred spirits in that, in that sense. So I wanted to mention that. That resonated with me a lot. When a high potential startup who's got two tech founders, let's say, and they've got this wonderful tech, but they cannot articulate what mm. problem is it solving, more often than not, that firm is, is going to run out of funds. Maybe they've got some yes. Series A or some seed funding, and they're going to run out of funds. It's the firms that really figure out what problem are we solving and who, and who is it for? And mm -hmm. as that leads us into this conversation about corporations and big companies and not startups, but how big companies innovate and how they've lost their way on innovation, that's mm -hmm. really the crux of what I want to talk about today. So I appreciate you sharing sure. your background on innovations. And I do have your book in front of me, by the way, which is called Innovating Innovation. And you listed out some career highlights, which is just incredible of the breadth of things you've worked on. So I do want to acknowledge that you've built some technologies and companies, not everything worked out the way you would have expected it to. Mm. So on your, on your path to working with big companies in between was probably what, 20 years of building and creating and, and exiting, however, those exited, <laughs> exiting startups, exiting these technology applications. And then you probably also did some of this work at Big Co. So can you talk about Small Co, Big Co, and, and maybe sure. some of the innovations along the way? Yeah. So I built 20 of my own startups, over 20. I rounded to 20. And a lot of people are like, red flag, why, why so many? And uh, one of the things I do that my serial, other serial contemporaries of mine, serial entrepreneurs, don't do is I recognize my failures. I'm not ashamed of them. I don't hide them. I don't push them away. They didn't work. That doesn't mean I don't work. My, my startups are not me. Um, that's one of the big things I could coach new entrepreneurs about is don't personalize the thing you're creating and make it all about you. It should always be about the radical love of the customer. You need to have a radical love of your customer and solve their problems. Use technologies to change their life. And it could be one of my, my companies that was a, a big success was a company called Skin It. And 2004, I came with the idea to personalize consumer electronics with uh, easy to apply stickers, custom cut for them. And something is in the grand scheme of things as trivial as that, you know, making your phone look cool. I still had a radical love of the customer. And what was interesting is with that company, I made all these different consumer electronic devices look cool. And the, the fan mail I would get about how meaningful my little simple invention was to some people. Uh, someone uploaded a photo of their new baby and put it on their phone, and that's what they showed everyone. And I would get all these uh, amazing um, fan emails or letters, and I, I realized that my radical love of the customer, I invented a technology and created a whole system to manufacture these things at scale, was impacting people's lives in a positive way. And I think that's a problem that most big companies just don't understand. I think they have a radical love, but it's for shareholders and not customers. And I think that's why most big companies are failing to innovate at scale anymore, is they're more concerned about radically loving their shareholders and giving them a return than investing in their customers and radically loving them and creating technology that delights and makes them happy and makes their lives better. And I think that's one of the big unlocks I've had in my, in my career. Going back to the failures is I keep track of them all. And uh, I, I post them. I talk about them. I'm not ashamed of them. I think I'm batting at 40% success uh, last time I scored it. Which is very which high, is, by the way. <laughs> which is pretty good. The more you do something, the more you you learn. Yeah, when you um, say, ten, you know, for a venture capital firm, if they get one out of 10 to hit a home run, they're, they're, that math works for them, right? Yeah. And one of the things I learned along the way is my 200-hour rule. Um, so when I come up with an idea, I usually come up with dozens of ideas, hundreds of ideas, and then I filter them based upon my own credible claim. On that idea, do I have within me something, some secret sauce, some connection, um, some uh, ability, some affection, some something 
on that particular idea to add value to it. Like, for example, uh, I created a company called Odojo, which ended up being a success. I only had it for six months. Uh, I sold it at the end of six months because it was solving the problem of uh, keeping kids safe online on social media, the advent of social media. And the problem is I don't have kids. So I created an amazing technology that was able to keep kids safe um, and help parents understand what was happening. But when I was going out to sell it, I had no credible claim because I couldn't point to my own kids using it. Um, and so that's why now I had this 200 hour rule. I have to have a credible claim on the ideas I work on and I start the clock. And then I have 200 hours. I have 200 hours to make significant traction on the idea. And every idea is a little bit different, but significant traction within 200 hours is showing a pitch deck to somebody about the idea and them wanting to participate, whether it's an investment or be a customer or join it or make introductions or partner. There has to be a significant amount of that. And then at 200 hours, I have a timer uh, for all my projects at the top of my computer. At the end of 200 hours, if there's not significant traction, I kill it. I name everything create companies around everything, because I always try to project success out of the gates, try to manifest success. Uh, but at the end of 200 hours, it, it's not worth my time to work on something, hoping uh, that some way, somehow, something magical is going to happen along the way to make it a success. Yeah, I believe I create the future. If I can't create something of value within 200 hours, I move on to the next idea. Who is your most important customer? the person who buys your business. Stony Hill Advisors works with owners to maximize the value when you're ready to sell. Get started today with a business valuation by visiting stonyhilladvisors.com slash podcast. You know, there's a beautiful story in your book about Skin It and when you were in a mm -hmm. restaurant. Can you share that story? Sure. One of the things I always try to tell new entrepreneurs uh, or even people in, in, in corporate careers is identify the moments in your life that made you emote, that really hit you hard and really define that and really create the story around it. Uh, really identify, write it down, because that story will be worth a lot in the future to other people. It, it helps other people understand better. And that's the story I think you're talking about. So um, this is year two, Skin It, um, worked all day. Got done, went to the uh, a place called Tokyo Joe's, the food, fast food restaurant. Going through the line, and in front of me was a mom and her kid. A young kid, first day at kindergarten, and he's bawling his eyes out. And uh, talking about how he hated school, all the kids were picking on him, he never wants to go back. Um, he was just really, really upset. And I could tell the mom was just completely out of her own. I mean, she did not know what to say. There was nothing she could say to calm him down. And he was very upset. And as I watched that child, it affected me. Normally, I'm I, my nickname at the time was Willy Wonka the West. I, I just stayed in my factory creating amazing things. Um, so it was very, and I'm very introverted. Um, so it was very typical of what I did next. They went and sat down. I went up to them. I took out my business card, I knelt down next to their table and handed the business card to the lady. And I was like, I couldn't help but hearing what's going on. And I think I can help. And so she looked at me like I was crazy, but I think she was at wit's end. So she gave me some, some runway and I took out my phone and I had a U.S. Army sticker on the back of it. And I showed it to the boy and I told him, I, I own a sticker factory and I, I make magic stickers and I would love to make some stickers for you. And his eyes got really big. And he looks at his mom, looks back at me, and he was just like, really? And I was like, yes. If your mom will write down your address, I will send you some stickers. And she took a leap of faith with me that day. On the back of my business card, she wrote down her address, handed it back to me. And uh, I told the kid, I'm going to go to my factory right now and make you some stickers. So I went and back to the office, left them. Uh, I sat down. Everyone had gone home. So it was just me. It was a magical night. Um, designed a series, I think I made like 20, 30 stickers, all the pro sports teams in Denver, uh, anything I thought, you know, a young six-year-old boy would want. Um, put them in an envelope, sent them off. Um, didn't think twice about it. Put my business card in there that she had wrote the address down, did it, checked out, gone. And I forgot about it. So busy running a startup and I thought I was doing a nice thing, boom. Um, the following Monday, 
um, I get a phone call. No, following Tuesday, I get a phone call. Um, and she said, <laughs> it was her. She called me. She says, this is Mike Snuffle. I go, yes. She goes, I don't even know if you remember me, but you made some stickers for my son. And I was like, oh, yeah, how did, how did he like them? And she said, you have no idea what you've done. To this day, that makes me tear up because hearing that, my natural instinct is I did something wrong. And she, I said, what happened? And she told me this st amazing story. She goes, I went, um, it, he went out to the mailbox the next day. The stickers went there, went out the next day and they were, and he was so excited. It was Saturday and we took them out. We laid them all out. And I finally understood what you meant by magical stickers. And we pros and cons on all of them or which one he wanted to put on. And um, then he asked me, can he do show and tell? And uh, <laughs> she was like taken aback, like here's my son who's being bullied at school, wants to stand up in front of his class and show his magical stickers. And so she wrote a note, did it. He went to school on Monday and um, she went to go pick him up on Monday and she couldn't find him. He wasn't at the curb. And uh, she was all upset because over the previous few days that he was in school, every day he was right at the curb as quickly as possible, trying to get him to the car. And he wasn't there. So she parked, gets out. She's looking everywhere in a panic. And she finally hears his laugh. And so as she's telling me this, I'm sitting on the phone like, oh, my God, what is this going to happen? What's what's going on here? And she told me that she heard his laugh and she stepped to the side and she saw him talking to a group of guys, friends, new friends. And he looked just like a normal kid. And so eventually he saw her, grabbed the kid, and they ran over to her. And she, he introduces his new best friend, and the best friend leans, tells the mother, she goes, your son's so cool, I wish I had diabetes too. And that was the amazing thing about those stickers I made. The kid was bullied because he had an insulin pump. He had to wear an insulin pump, a uh, Medtronic's insulin pump. And that's the whole reason he was being bullied, is he was different. And when I knelt down at that table, I looked at the, the Medtronic's insulin pump on his hip, and I tried to remember every detail because I had to go back and create stickers to custom fit it. And I nailed it on my first try. I have no idea how that happened. Divine intervention on that one. And uh, what I did is I helped that kid by those stickers mask his disability in something cool. I don't even know which one he probably, probably chose Denver Broncos. Um, masked it. And... Uh, made his disability something he could talk about. And that's one of the things I, I think a lot about. Um, I talk to a lot of product companies. I work with a lot of product companies is those moments. Are you, are you innovating to create those moments? Um, a simple sticker company transformed a young boy's life. I think that's really cool. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. It is amazing. It's moving and I think it does illustrate the point of the power of uh, an entrepreneur to connect and to try to solve a problem. That particular problem wasn't what you set out to solve with, with this innovation in it, but it had an amazing radical love, you know, and that connection will be mm. living on forever. As yeah. companies get bigger in their corporate life cycle from startup to adolescent to adult, the corporate life cycle sometimes can take us in the other direction where there's a decline mm. and a fall. And it is possible for, um, for companies to come back from that other side, the Death Valley, but it's difficult. And as, as companies go from Gen 1 to Gen 2 to Gen 3 to eventually this large, mature company that's been around a long time, generations, mm. they get further and further away from their entrepreneurial roots. Mm. And it becomes a challenge. It becomes more internal, right? It becomes about solving things that maybe the customer doesn't care about, or we're so far away from the customer, mm -hmm. which is why I'm passionate about this topic about corporate innovation and what mature companies can do to get back to those entrepreneurial roots. So let's talk about how you've helped some of those big companies do that with a corporate innovation process. How have you seen this working or not working in big companies? Uh, that's a good question. First, I probably should tell about my transition into being the corporate realm. Um, after building enough companies and mentoring at all these incubators and tech startups and stuff, uh, corporate executives started noticing about a decade ago that um, they were losing an accelerating market share to startups. The startups were going from zero 
to unicorn in a very fast trajectory. Um, and that's getting faster and faster. You look at the generative AI companies, it's almost overnight. Um, and so they're being disrupted. Um, their businesses are being disrupted. The, the margins, Pepsi and Coke aren't competing against each other anymore. Uh, they're competing against the thousands of young startups out there that are stealing an advancing market share. And so corporate executives realized uh, there's something magical going on. Uh, it's not a trend. It's not a fad. Uh, Accenture and all the big five consulting firms were wrong that the age of the entrepreneur is here and it's here to stay. And it actually has all the advantages over the corporate. And so <laughs> they started reaching out to people they knew. And luckily, all the companies I have worked on, my sales process would I would build a technology like Skin It. And then I would partner with another larger entity that had customers and I would white label it with their brand. So like HP and Dell were two of my big customers at Skin It, where they would market laptop skins to all their customers. So I didn't have to have a big sales organization. And in doing that, I worked with all these corporate innovation uh, people and all these large companies, carriers, hardware companies, brands like Disney. So I've worked with a ton of innovation people over the year in the corporate realm. And so it was natural they would reach out to me and say, hey, uh, can you come in and talk to us about what it means to be an entrepreneur and kind of what you think and how you act? And so the tagline for my company is I help executives, uh, corporate executives think and act more entrepreneurial. So I get pulled in and, you know, day one, I have to like start changing how they actually, their psychology of how they think about their business. Because like you said, they think about it in a, a very operator way. They operate the machine of the business. Um, and they have this word called enough. It's good enough. They, I hear enough a lot in the corporate realms, like this is good enough. Um, or this uh, innovation solves this problem enough. It's like a limiter. It's a stop of where they're comfortable and uh, fear begins. And they don't want to journey into that fear. And in the startup realm, nothing is enough. We live in a land of we can we invent the future. We can create anything. Uh, we can change anything. We can disrupt it. There are no rules. We're not. We don't create rules in the startup room to self limit us. In fact, I argue there's 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 definitely no rules. There's some laws, that, but even laws are up for negotiation as Airbnb and Uber have uh, pushed uh, against those. And so startups push against things, um, and corporate doesn't. They they stay within a very defined, comfortable, manageable, um, non-fear-inducing innovation bubble. But unfortunately, all the advantages that they once had, plentiful capital, plenty of time, top talent, uh, access to expensive infrastructure and technologies, that's all been democratized. They no longer have that. It's it's available to me as a startup. I can have an idea today and be in production in a week. And so they don't have the advantage anymore that they have. All they have is a legacy brand, a lot of data, and a lot of insight, and a lot of relationships. And that's it. And it's easy to whittle away all those over time. So I think that's the big difference between startups and corporate is startups aren't playing by a set of self-imposed rules of limitation and big companies are. There's different types of innovation out there. If mm -hmm. someone's thinking about innovation, they might think, oh, it has to be a disruptive technology, something yeah. that's completely different. It's a whole new, you know, when the airplane was invented, right? It, yeah. it completely changed travel as one disruptive technology example. Mm -hmm. And then there's incremental innovation, which helps mm -hmm. us improve our products and services in an incremental way. Like whenever you get a new app update on your phone, that's an incremental innovation mm -hmm. because it's helping to move the product or service forward. And then there's other categories of innovation. When you're working with a big company and they're saying, hey, we want to we want to do better. You know, we want to innovate. Mm -hmm. Either we need a process or we need to jumpstart our creativity internally, or we need to not be, you know, let, let's let loose on the word enough. How do we stop ourselves from saying it's enough? How do we think more broadly? As you reflect on the different types of projects that you've done with big companies where you are the innovation consultant, if we can use that use that title, or an innovation advisor, what, what types of things are you seeing as the problems? Like, why are they bringing you in? The biggest reason I'm brought in is because what they're doing isn't working anymore. The existing way 
of innovating no longer launches a product at the end of it that's competitive. It's late. It's always late now. Big companies are always late to the market. Um, and you got to take the outliers out of the picture. You, know? you got to take the Googles, the Facebooks, the Apples, the, the Amazons. You got to take those companies because they're really good, large, innovative companies. Um, you got to take the um, fashion brands or the consumer packaged goods companies. By the time they come up with something new and go through their just insane process of approvals and get into the market, it, they've already missed the trend. And so they've already they've already six, they've already given away their customer, their historically earned customer. They gave them to a startup for free because they couldn't respond with a good product to the startup. The startup saw a trend, saw a, a new thing, saw a, a new way, even an incremental, a small little thing, like in the beverage space. Small little changes have big, big uh, ramifications. And so these larger entities always think that they're going to be able to launch and because they have scale and they have connections and they have distribution that it matters. No, it doesn't matter anymore. It, it's irrelevant. Um, if that is your defensible position, you've already lost the innovation game. So what a lot of big companies do now is they're trying to change their thought around maybe we shouldn't innovate on disruptive stuff internally. Maybe we should just acquire startups that are disrupting things internally. And we see that definitely in the consumer packaged goods space. Um, yeah, build versus buy. How long will yeah. it take us to do it? What's going to cost us to do it? And what are the alternatives? And I'm a big fan of that because as an entrepreneur, the only thing... I create something, and this is one of the big things I have to coach new entrepreneurs is when you create something, why? It's I get it to change the world, radical love of the customer, but your journey is a tie to that. What is your exit of that? When do you get a leave? You're not going to run it forever. In fact, I actually argue that most innovators should not operate their own businesses. Um, when do you leave? When do you get your, your big payout? Um, and so everyone has these fancies that they're going to build a sustainable long-term company, but it's really, really hard to do that with large multinational conglomerates that just have efficiencies at that level. Um, that you, it's hard to compete against. That's why we see so many startups being acquired by, especially in the consumer packaged goods space or the beverage space, so many startups being acquired. Um, is it the founder of the business wants to get paid, have an outsized exit? Um, and move on to something new, and the business gets a valuable intellectual property piece that they can roll in and probably kill and just, you know, over-process, over-manage, over-operate it, and it will just disappear into oblivion. But that's me being jaded. <laughs> Was that your experience with your companies that you were building to mm -hmm. sell, that you had an idea and you reverse engineered, so to speak, like you, you thought yeah. ahead on if I build this technology or this product or this service, who might it fit and what problem is it solving for them? Yeah, I, I think on any new thing you begin, like being an entrepreneur, when I first became an entrepreneur, there's the romance phase where you're changing the world, radical love of the customer and trying to uh, make a difference. And then eventually you start to realize all right, I only have so many years of productivity in my life. I kind of want to retire one day. I kind of start thinking about the financial aspect of this. And so after 20 companies now, I, I think very, very specifically about intellectual property creation as wealth creation and uh, my own wealth creation. And I, I, that's one of the reasons why I have the 200-hour rule is uh, I know exactly how much that costs me in time. Uh, I know exactly how much that time is worth. Um, I'm willing to make that bet, but I won't, I'm not willing to spend one dollar more than that. And, I, and that has been informed by working with corporations who look at acquiring things through a very intellectual property wealth creation metrics. And so that's one of the nice things. I'm, and I'm doing this right now with my book. So my first book was uh, the one you're, you you have a copy of, Innovating Innovation, was my altruistic book. This is my book to help corporate executives figure out innovation. Uh, my next book, Million Dollar Ideator, is more about wealth creation. Uh, it's about how do you come up with million dollar ideas? Uh, because I believe that if you can't ideate, you'll be working for someone who can. So if you're not a great ideator, you're at the mercy of those who create ideas. 
And I think coming up with a great million dollar idea, whether you're in a job or you're an entrepreneur or in any aspect of life, uh, is the only route to true independent wealth, period. For sure. And it's good advice. I, I talk to students who are pursuing entrepreneurship, either because it's a degree in entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. getting their MBA or undergrad, or they're tech students. Actually, just so timely, this conversation, I'm going tomorrow to campus at Carnegie Mellon to do this talk about different types of entrepreneurship and different ways to think about not only, like you're saying, what are they passionate about? What do they enjoy? But where might it lead them? And yeah. it isn't always about invention. There's other ways to be an entrepreneur, one of which is to be a corporate intrapreneur, if we can use that mm -hmm. word, and finding your path within a company. But if you want to, if you want to become that million dollar ideator, then mm -hmm. yeah, how do you find that big idea? And it, it's really exciting. You've got so much great experience. I know if it's hard to boil it down to just a few things, but if a mature company wants to think about innovation, especially as we're heading into a recessionary time, and maybe they're saying, oh, it's belt tightening mm -hmm. time. I can't be investing in innovation. What are those two to three reasons why mm -hmm. you'd say, oh, that's wrong. You need to continue investing these are the benefits. These are things to think about. I would tell them to look historically. It's not by chance when we go into uh, tough times that radical new technologies are launched right at the beginning of tough times. The iPhone kind of came out right before the last big re or, um, recession and generative AI and robotics and a lot of um, really interesting tech is being launched right now and startups are going crazy. I counsel large companies that I'll just use generative AI as the example. Um, there's a lot of hucksters. There's a lot of scammers. It's the next crypto. There's just a lot of noise being generated around it. But the core technologies are fascinating and the core technologies are disruptive. They will have a huge impact um, in ways that we don't even know yet. Entrepreneurs haven't invented all the cool ways that we can use this te new technology, this new palette of paintbrushes uh, to create the next next. If you ignore it, if you don't have people within your business coming up with the interesting ideas, at least creating the patents, at least creating the, the, the ideas that are worth billions internally and securing that intellectual property, then you're going to be at the mercy of a whole new host of startups because it has never been easier to build a startup. And we might be in a downturn of startup funding right now, and that has more because of market conditions, but there has never been as much money sitting on the sidelines ready to invest in the next group of startups ever. I mean, it is a massive amounts of capital ready to be deployed. And if you're a big business and you don't recognize that, then you will be acquiring your next round of products at a premium versus building them in-house with talented people that you already have on staff. And so that's the advice I give them. And then usually they want to understand more, like, why aren't they doing it now? And what, why aren't we uh, making this difference now? And then I said, well, because your psychology of your business is wrong for innovators. You got to let them actually do what you want them to do. You got to allow them to be curious. And curiosity is the one I always point to right now, because curiosity in a large business in this economic environment is being clamped down, pushed out, penalized. If you're curious right now, it's a tax. Stop being curious. And I've heard that. Stop being, stop trying to figure out um, how to make things better. We need to stop spending money. And I think that's the wrong move right now because everyone I know that is a talented entrepreneur is working on amazingly cool stuff. And they're going to get start getting funding later this year into next year. And there's going to, it's going to be this whole new renaissance of cool startups, just like in the early, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, you know, when Uber, Airbnb, all these really cool things came out. Uh, I think we're going to see a whole new renaissance of tech startups coming out over the next four or five years. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if big businesses want to ignore it, that's fine. That's why there's the term disruption. Disruption doesn't just happen. It, you know, my definition of innovation is the human response to evolution. If you ignore evolution, if you ignore, if you ignore the, ev the evolving of things around you long enough, that wall eventually collapses onto you. And that's what's called disruption. Yeah, no, for sure. There are so many things that you shared today that I think people will 
really value and maybe want to listen to this episode again and, and over and over. It's very inspiring. And some of the key messages, just to reiterate, is we can't just sit back on our laurels. We can't just let things happen, whether a big company or a small company, privately held corporations, things are changing and evolving. And if we don't participate in that process, we're going to be left behind. It's also a wonderful message to stay close to the customer, be passionate about what problems you can solve for them. And the story you shared about the young boy is, is of course, a, a very individual story. But if we take that to the bigger picture, it's about listening to your customers. It's about understanding what they care about and how do you solve their pain points. And ultimately, too, finding that ROI, right? If it's build mm -hmm. versus buy, that's we're driving to make the world a better place. But we do want to create value for our companies. And so for our listeners who know this show for a long time, you know, a couple of years now we've been doing this show and the, the pillars of this show are innovation, growth, and transition. And if you think about it in that context, you've hit on all three, hmm. which is, yeah, you as the owner, as the tech innovator, this is not your baby, that it's your identity, but you've created something, you've put it good in the world. And that's a special thing, but it's not you if it lives or dies, right? You don't live or die with a company. And so separating from it at one day, thinking about it at that earlier stage is a good thing. And I advocate for that. That in and of itself creates value and thinking yes. about that exit. And so all these themes together in this show was very, very powerful. So thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your insights with us. If people want to get in touch with you, what's a great way for them to do that? Um, I just funnel everyone now to MikeStemple.com. Um, Stemple, S-T-E-M-P-L-E, Temple with an S at the beginning. Uh, so makestemple.com. Everything else links out from there. Um, everything I'm working on, all the companies uh, I'm involved in. Um, all my new nonprofit stuff's going up there as well. All my books are up there, the, the two. Um, so that I would go makestemple.com. Awesome, awesome. And as I ask all my guests, if they have a favorite quote, something that mm -hmm. inspires you for leadership or entrepreneurship, What's something that you'd like to share with me? Uh, it's, it's my own quote. Um, I know that's kind of self-serving, but I, I love this. I remember the day I came up with it. Uh, it goes like this. Inspiration leads to hope. Hope leads to courage and courage replaces fear. Um, seek inspiration out every single day and that will give you hope. Um, when you have enough hope, that actually feeds into this thing called courage. Uh, you can't be courageous without hope. Um, and when you have courage, uh, doing crazy things just becomes easier. You're actually in the mind. They've done scientific studies that show that courage and fear occupy the same part of our brain. And it's like a glass. When you put courage in, fear comes out. And so there's the more courage you can have, the, the less fear you'll experience. And I think that's a, a big thing going into this next economic season we're going into is don't go into it afraid there will be an end. This too shall pass. Um, believe that you create the future and you will. Yeah. And come out stronger on the other side. For sure. Thank you so much, Mike, for being with me today. I really appreciate you being here. Of course. I, I had a good time. Thank you for having me. And to all the listeners, thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe to Succession Stories on YouTube. Watch this full video interview. And of course, subscribe in your favorite podcast player to catch all the episodes of Succession Stories. We've got a, a lot of things going on in our archive. Be sure to check that out. And if you want to set up time to meet with me one-on-one, go to meetlauriebarkman.com. Thanks again for tuning in. I hope that today's episode resonated with you. What actions will you take as a result? If you want to grow, sell, or transition your business, our strategic transition planning process provides clarity and objectivity on the big questions that may be weighing on your mind. Make an intention and take the next step. Set up a complimentary consultation with me to discuss your goals at thebusinesstransitionsherpa.com. That's thebusinesstransitionsherpa.com.